Hey, church. How are you? You look fantastic. Um, man, I'm just so happy to be in church with you. It's a little chilly. Weather's perfect to be in church, right? There's nowhere else we should be today than the house of the Lord. Last week, I, <clears throat> I did a teaching on thanks and giving. And I think it was a wonderful teaching. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go back onto our YouTube page, Church YouTube, or website, exchangechurch.org. Uh, Facebook's a little more difficult, but I really encourage you to watch last week's sermon because I think it lays a groundwork, not just for Thanksgiving, but for living. And I, I told you last week that Jesus doesn't just want you to get right, he wants you to get well. That's, that's true. He wants you to live the abundant life. John 10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I, I hope I convinced you last week that that is, that is the crescendo of Christian living. Not to say yes so that your ticket to heaven is punched. And I hope I see you in heaven. That, that would be a bummer if you're not there. But that's not where we end in the Christian life. Saying yes, saying the salvation Prayer, asking God into our heart is just the beginning to a life that is ever increasing, ever growing, ever beautiful. And so I hope that you will uh, continue to get well. There are some people that when they pass on and they, they transition to heaven, I think to myself, well, they're finally well. And I know you know people like this as well. They just, all of their life, they dealt with certain issues, certain complexities of life, certain inadequacies, you know, they never felt good enough, never had this thing of rejection, whatever it is, and you think when they pass on, you think, ah, oh, they're with Jesus and they're finally well. That's not the goal. The goal isn't that you get well when you die. The goal is that you get well now so that that wellness can be a spring of life to those that are around you, to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers. Jesus didn't die just so that you could get right. He died so that you could get well. Can I get an amen? Oh, I want you well. I want to be well. I don't think it's without, I don't think it's beyond the reach of possibility for us. I know that you've struggled with certain things your whole life and you've almost befriended it. You've almost just you know, giving it a seat in your car. It's like you just get into your car and then you, you buckle up insecurity, you buckle up anxiety, you, you buckle up anger right next to you and it's just become a part of who you are. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there's good news from heaven. There is freedom in the room because God wants you well. You already paid for it. I, I told you last week, the joy is an indication of the transformation of your soul. You want to know how healthy your heart is? How much joy do you have? I talked about that last week. And, and joy is not this fuzzy, ethereal, like cloudy mist that's in the air. Jo joy is something that we can actually cultivate and grow in our own life. And I know just like you know that we're coming upon the time of year that is the most happy time of year and the most dreaded time of year. We need joy. And the Bible is very clear on what we should do to get joy. The Bible tells us that if we will walk in gratitude, that will stir the waters of joy in our life. I can't manufacture joy. I can't fabricate it. I, I can put on a mask and pretend that I've got it, but who wants that? I want the real thing. And to get the real joy that Jesus came to give, I have to choose to walk in gratitude. Be grateful. Be thankful. Gratitude is a decision that produces joy. If you want joy, you got to go to the thing that will give you joy, and that's gratitude. We learned last week that gratitude is a decision that produces joy. And when I choose to be grateful, I am choosing joy. Lord, I come before you today. I thank you so grateful for the people in this room. God, I'm also grateful that the stripes turned out okay on the walls. I'm grateful for your presence that is in this place. Oh God, let us, 
let us not put on a show today. Give us the courage to lay our heart bare, to trust you, the healer, the surgeon, the lover of our soul. Let us trust you in this moment. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let the church say, amen, amen. I hope you chose this week to be grateful. Did you choose to be grateful this week? Yes, it, listen, if you didn't choose this week to be grateful on Thanksgiving, you're going to have a pretty hard go of it the other 52, 51 weeks of the year because this was the easiest week of all to be grateful. Can I get a good amen? So I hope you were grateful. I'm grateful that you were grateful. How's that? I, I, I am grateful. I, <clears throat> I'm grateful that this week I was able to get back into the gym. Uh, I've been out for a few weeks, and it was due to sickness a week and a half ago. I wasn't feeling too well. I was down on a Wednesday and a Thursday, and so I was out, and then I had a knee flare up. You remember last Sunday, I was telling you my knee was hurting. Pray for it. Amazing. Uh, by that, that night, my knee was better, and I was able to get back into the gym this week, and I was super excited. Now, usually, when I've been out for a couple of weeks from the gym, and I go back to the gym, and I'm, I'm, I'm pumping iron. It's a lot of weight, guys, a lot of weight that I do. And I'm in the gym, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and there's this moment that I think, oh, I'm so glad to be back. I don't know if, you, if you've ever experienced that. Maybe it's the gym for some of you. Maybe it's like you've not had time to watch your favorite show, and then you sit down and you turn it on. Well, for me, it was the gym. And it, whenever I've been out and I go back to the gym, I think, oh, I'm back at home. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. Now, I can tell you that this week, I can honestly say, I did not think that. I did not, there was not a moment where I was pumping iron and I thought, this feels right. I, I remember thinking to myself, why am I doing this? Um, it's way too cold for this. I remember thinking, what's the point? I've wasted two weeks of progress. Uh, two weeks, I've, I've done nothing. I'm not even like squatting the same weight that I was two weeks ago. Who loses muscle that fast? What's the point? I mean, if you're just going to lose it within two weeks, why even pack it on? Who cares? I'm, not, I'm definitely not feeling this. I could be eating brownies and peppermint ice cream right now. Those were my thoughts. Literally, I'm not exaggerating for the sake of the sermon. Those were my thoughts. And I, I cut my workout about 20 minutes short, and I'm walking out to my car, and I'm feeling a bit beat up, discouraged, disheartened. I knew I had not given it 100%. I knew I had cut my, my workout short, and I felt defeated because I hadn't even been there in two weeks. Like, that should have been a good rest. I've, I hadn't been to the gym in two weeks, and listen, for whatever the gym party was not happening for me, there was a nice pity party in my Suburban. I turned the music up loud, and I was soaking in my woes, and I was just having a good old time with me and all of, all of my issues until a line from last week's sermon came into my mind. Now, I like preaching to you. <laughs> but when I pre preaching for me, I think Jesus is messing with me. In that moment, I remember thinking, Jesus didn't look down at his hands to see the bread and see the lack. He looked up toward heaven. Gratitude comes from what you choose to look at. I was like, yeah, I hope someone's putting that into practice this week. <laughs> then I intentionally began to change my focus. Now, this may seem like no big deal to you, but for someone who, who is trying to get well, trying to eat right, trying to go to the gym six days a week, like putting all of my energy into it to be out two weeks, I was, I was getting pretty blue. And so I'm sitting there in my car, and Holy Spirit reminds me of an incredible sermon that you should listen to. Gratitude comes from what you choose to look at. And I thought to myself, I'm feeling blue because I hadn't been to the gym in two weeks. But there was a day 
not too long ago when I hadn't been to the gym in two years. I should feel pretty okay about missing two weeks. And yeah, I cut my workout 20 minutes short, but I pressed through 55 minutes of hell that I didn't want to be there and the endorphins never even showed up. But that's 55 minutes. And, and yeah, I'm, I may not be building muscle today, but I'm building habits that are building muscle tomorrow. I just shifted my focus. And, and you guessed it, as I shifted my focus and I was grateful, <laughs> grateful to be back in the gym doing a shortened workout, not building much muscle. I, I was grateful to be there. And as I was grateful, my joy tank started to fill. So yeah, I get to live the things that I preach, just like I'm asking you to live the things that I'm preaching. And there's something else besides joy that gratitude produces. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We want to set our sails today for that. Gratitude produces generosity. Gratitude produces generosity. And as we cultivate thankful hearts for God's goodness, his provision, and his presence, generosity will flow naturally from our lives. Now, I hope you're hearing me today. This is not so much a sermon about money as it is a sermon about your heart. That's why in my opening prayer, I said, God, give us the courage to lay our heart bare. Because I'm not asking you to examine your checkbook this morning. I'm asking you to examine your heart. To have some deep conversations with Holy Spirit as we talk today. I, I want to get into the word this morning so that the word will get into you. If you'll go to Exodus chapter 35, verses 4 through 9. When my wife came off the platform from doing offering, I asked her, why did she steal my sermon? Um, I almost just came up here and just said, Carrie, why don't you just lead us in an altar call? Uh, because she preached my sermon. But this will give you additional, at least she didn't use my text. This will give you additional proof that what she said is true. Exodus chapter 34, 35. Verses 4 through 9. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. So we're heading into a text that is a command from the Lord, and they're preparing to take an offering. Verse 5. Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So the Lord is commanding an offering. And then we go to the book end of the story. You can read the rest of that chapter this week if you want to, 35. But we're going to jump to the end of this offering story with the children of Israel and jump to chapter 36, starting with verse 2. Then Moses called Bezalel and Oholiav. And every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. So Moses is calling all the craftsmen to come and build the tabernacle. It's a portable tabernacle. And they're requesting gold and silver and threads and all kinds of things that they're going to need. He calls them together in verse 3. They received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing, and they spoke to Moses. They pulled Moses aside and said, hey, Moses, listen, Moses, um, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. They're bringing too much. <laughs> so Moses gave a commandment. 
And they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. Have you ever been to a church service where the pastor got up and said, Stop giving. It's just too much. I pray we have one of those days at the Exchange Church. I really, I would love, I would love to be like, hey, just stop, stop it, keep, keep all your threads, <laughs> keep your rams, your ephod stuff. No more giving. I, I believe that if 100% of followers of Jesus surrendered to the call of God on their life to live generously with an open heart and an open hand that every church in town would have more than enough to meet the needs of the vision, and they might even start funneling some of this money to do other things in the region, other things in the nation for Haiti or Africa or Central America. Are you, are you with me? I really believe that. I really believe that if every believer took God at his word and, and was obedient in their giving and lived beyond obedience but stepped into generosity, you can't actually be generous until you're obedient. But when we're obedient with the 10%, then we step into generosity. If every person lived with a generous heart, the church would be unstoppable. The church is unstoppable, unstoppable now because the Holy Spirit is breathing on it. But could you imagine what we could do if we partnered our resource with what God was wanting to do? Not just at the Exchange Church, but globally. So we have at least one example in Scripture, and I think there are maybe four total. But at least one in Scripture where the people had given so heartily that it was time to stop, just shut it off, no more giving. And before announcing the list, Moses clarifies what kind of giver he's looking for. So he wants to make sure, and I want to make sure to you as we head into Legacy Offering, to clarify what kind of giver we're looking for at the Exchange Church. I think it's the same here. Moses tells them, whoever is of a willing heart, whoever is of a willing heart, let them bring a contribution. Now this word willing is translated from two Hebrew words. The first one is N-A-D-I-B. N-A-D-I-B, Nadiv. And it means pertaining to being voluntary, uncoerced, implying generosity. They were willing. We use the word willing too loosely, I think. If a cop is behind you and they turn their lights on and maybe you were going 70 and a 35 and 70 and a 55, what, whatever. The, the lights are going off behind you and you are either unwilling to pull over or you are willing to pull over, right? I'm always willing to pull over when a cop wants to say hello. It's better than being unwilling. However, being willing to pull over from the cop is not quite the same willing as what the Lord is looking for when he says, bring your offering, bring your tithe, bring your generosity. That willing is not, okay, the Lord sees me. This willing goes much deeper. This is, I'm not being coerced. I'm not being forced. I'm not, I'm not being guilted. Listen, I don't want anyone to feel guilted into giving. I am convinced that the Lord can do more with your unguilted money than he can with your guilted money. I, I would rather you keep your money than to believe that you've been guilted into giving it to the Lord. Because maybe if you'll keep it, you'll realize just how much you stink at managing 100%. Because when we give God his 10%, there is a covering and a blessing that comes on the 90%. And I don't know how it happens. I don't know how my suburban, when I'm being faithful in the giving, how my suburban, the tank of gas lasts a little bit 
longer or how the food goes a little bit further or the lettuce stays in or the avocados last for two days rather than two minutes. Like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I just know that there is a covering that rests on a home who trusts God with their finances. Willing, not coerced. So don't feel coerced. At all. Not at this church. There may be some churches that coerce you. They may charge a cover fee. Oh, no, that's a club. Um, they may charge you a fee to, to be a part of worship and be a part of the show. Oh, no, that's a movie theater. <laughs> Everywhere in the world will charge you to participate. But this is based on your willingness to give without coercion. And the second Hebrew word is L-E-B. L-E-B is pronounced lev. A B in Hebrew is a V, Lev, L-E-V, and it means the inner man, the source of life from the inner person. So when God is saying he's looking for a willing person to contribute to this big offering, he's saying, I'm looking for someone whose inner man is generous and wants to contribute, not because it's on a calendar as a legacy offering, not because it's that time of service where you get to go up to the barrel and good grief, if I don't go to the barrel, they're going to think I'm not giving, not because you need to write it off on your taxes, which we do receive any tax exempt donations you would like to give. But the point is God is looking for someone who is wanting to give because there's a generosity inside of you that is flowing from your heart to your hands. Exodus 36, verse 2. I I love how Moses is inviting everyone who has a generous heart to give, but then he calls all the craftsmen, all all the people that are good with their hands, that can build things. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this incredible manger. No. What is this? A stable. Isn't this amazing? Um, I did this. No, I'm kidding. Marshall Marshall and his brother did this, I believe. Is that right? Marshall and his brother built this, and it's incredible. They are a craftsman. They use their skill to bless the house of the Lord. And that's exactly what Moses is calling. He's saying, hey, don't just bring your gold and your silver and your bronze, but bring your talents too. Bring your skills too. And every gifted artisan whose heart the Lord has put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred, They came to do the work. Every gifted artisan whose heart was stirred came to do the work. This leads me to my first point. Generosity is more than finances. Finances are a part of it. And I love, I really love the conversation with people, the honest conversation when they say, well, I don't have money to give but I have time to give. And I'm like, no, you actually have both Um, because everyone has a 10%. Your 10% is less than my 10%, but it's equal sacrifice and obedience to God. Um, Now, maybe, maybe we've budgeted God out of our budget in which we need to repent and ask him to rescue us from our poor stewardship. Um, But we don't get to give our time in place of our money in fact, I had a great conversation with someone just this past week, and they said, but isn't that, isn't tithing Old, Old Testament? Can you explain that to me, Pastor? I was like, oh, yeah, it is Old Testament, and it's New Testament also. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and he said, hey, you know the law of, of fasting and tithing and the Sabbath and all of that stuff, and this new commandment I'm giving you, do the new thing, but don't forget the former thing. In other words, Jesus said it's A and B. B didn't come to replace A, it came to fulfill it, and it's A and B. Besides that, grace always raises higher than the law. The law, people say, well, the law was 10% tithing, Pastor. Jesus did away with the law. Yeah, he actually raised the bar. In the Old Testament, I got to give 10% and say it was done. But also, in the Old Testament, it said, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. Grace came along, and in the New Testament, he raised the standard. It's no longer about sleeping with the neighbor's wife. If I even look at her with lust in my heart, I've committed adultery. Grace doesn't lower the standard. It raises the standard, but grace empowers you to fulfill the standard. Are you with me? 
Generosity is more than finances. These craftsmen gave their work, the work of their hands. They gave their skill. And so today, in our context, it's not just about writing a check. And, and we are grateful for every penny that comes into this place. And we do our best to steward it well. And we pray over it. And, and we are very grateful. And there is, there is no amount too little to be given there is no amount too much to be given. We're grateful for it all because we know that you're partnering with what God is doing. But it's not just about writing a check or swiping a card. It's about investing your hearts. It's A and B. Point number two. Generosity ensures there is always enough. God will always give us provision for the vision. Pro vision. Pro is for, for the vision. Provision is for the vision. Some of you don't have money issues. You have vision issues in your family. Are you hearing me? We're praying, asking God to send us more money, and he's trying to get inside of our soul more vision. What else can you do with your hands? How else can you reach your neighbors? How else can you shout the glory of God? Maybe we should, if we're not seeing the income come in that we're praying for, maybe it's a vision problem. And once we get the vision right, there will be provision for the vision. Generosity ensures there is always enough. I love in Exodus 36, they kept bringing free will offerings every morning. Every morning. Not because they were coerced to do so. It wasn't because of compulsion. They just chose in their heart to continue to give an offering. What an overflow of generosity. Generosity ensures there is always enough. When God calls us to something, and God has called you to something, by the way. You may not know yet what it is, but this, this house in particular is not a, a call of God on Trey, or a call of God on the Rose family. This is a call of God for the region, for the world. God could take me out of this, and his vision for this is still going to keep going. It's way beyond a person, but God has a call for you to partner with. In our context, we're all part of the funding and part of the facilitating what God wants to do through the Exchange Church. Has anyone yet seen this year a Christmas carol? Do you know what a Christmas carol is with Scrooge and the three spirits? They weren't holy spirits. Scrooge, Christmas carol. I watch it every year. I really love live production. I'm a, I'm a theater guy, so anytime a Christmas carol is showing in Austin or in the area, I, I like to normally go and see it because I just love live theater. But A Christmas Carol is a classic. But when Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol, Thanksgiving wasn't invented yet. I bet if he had written A Christmas Carol when Thanksgiving had been invented, it would be called A Thanksgiving Carol. Because if you think about the storyline, it's all about Scrooge, this miser who doesn't appreciate anything. He has no gratitude for his past. He has no gratitude for the people in his life. He has no gratitude for his employees. Scrooge learned through the course of that movie, gratitude. He learned to open his hands and open his heart. It's a Thanksgiving story because an open heart will always lead to open hands. Do you remember at the end of the story, he flows, flies open the window and he, he's calling the the kids in the street and he says go get the turkey and send it here and he's he's very generous because he had a change of heart his heart became open and an open heart will always produce open hands thanks and giving are tied together in our text israel's willingness to give was the overflow of a thankful heart and that leads me to my final point today Generosity is gratitude in action. Oh, I wonder what it would be like 
to be in that tribe when they were given the opportunity to build this portable tabernacle of which God was establishing this notion that his presence will always go with us. They didn't know at the time. They thought it was just a place to worship. But God was saying to us in the New Testament that wherever you go, the presence is going to follow you. Israel had witnessed God in powerful ways. God had brought them from bondage out of Egypt. He enabled them to cross the Red Sea in Exodus 14. In Exodus 16, God provided manna and quail from heaven. Exodus 17, he caused water to flow from a rock. God had promised that his presence would go with Israel wherever they go, either by fire or by cloud. And at many points in this story, the children of Israel became disheartened, burned out, fearful. Yet at some point, they learned to trust God. They understood that the God who took care of them then, in bondage, through the river, in the wilderness, is the same God that is going to see us through there. Generosity is gratitude in action. Joy is gratitude inward. Generosity is gratitude outward. Recently, scientific research has been found that a neurological link between gratitude and generosity exists. Here's a good summary of its findings. It says, in a sense, gratitude seems to prepare the brain for generosity. Counting blessings is quite different than counting your cash. Because gratitude, just as philosophers and psychologists predict, point us toward moral behaviors, reciprocity, and pay-it-forward motivations. Apparently, our brain literally makes us feel richer when we help others. Perhaps this is why researchers have observed that grateful people give more. You want to know how grateful you are? We have two tests now. The test of joy and the test of giving. Joy and giving is an indicator of our gratitude. In December of 2020, in the middle of a global pandemic filled with enough social crisis to shake anyone's faith in goodness and in God, the BBC reported on a pay it forward that came out of Minnesota in a Dairy Queen drive through Dairy Queen. When one customer asked to pay for the car behind him in addition to his own meal, he started a chain reaction that lasted through, get this, 900 customers, $10,000 in sales, and two and a half days. When the store would shut down at night, the last person who would drive through would prepay for the first person the next morning. Is that not amazing? Two and a half days. 900 customers. I would hate to be that 900th person to know that that legacy stopped with me. A grateful heart is a generous heart. And this isn't just in the Old Testament. For all you New Testament lovers, the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11, he makes the link also between generosity and gratitude. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give, not as the pastor says, not the goal that we have, but he must give as he's decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, 
you may abound in every good work. For as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your needs for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Is that not amazing? Our gratitude produces a posture for giving, and we learn that our giving produces a posture for gratitude. And our gratitude produces a posture for giving, and our giving produces a posture for gratitude. And our gratitude produces a posture for giving, and our giving produces a, do you see the cycle that God intends you to live on? It's that way with joy. Our gratitude produces joy, and our joy produces gratitude, and our gratitude produces joy. This is the life, the abundant life that God died for you to have. And it is phenomenal to me that we can look at two very critical elements of life, joy and generosity, and see that it funnels down to gratitude. Something that is well within your control to implement. Carrie and I, we purpose in our hearts to be generous. You may have heard stories before when we're feeling blue, feeling down, feeling inadequate, feeling like God doesn't see us, feeling like the vision's not happening in any area of church leadership, or parenting, starting businesses outside of church, business deals outside of church. We, we've we're just like, God, where, where are you? Often one of us will come to the other and say, we got to go bless somebody. We don't know if they need it. We don't know if they need that money or need that car or need whatever it is that we're blessing someone with. But we know that we need it. We need to be a blessing to someone because when we're a blessing to someone, somehow God blesses us. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense how I can offer to you something and in return, God gives me so much more. Even the pain we go through is meant to be invested into someone else that's going through the pain you've overcome. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. But it all starts with a grateful heart. Will you stand? I'll be having lunch at Torchies in case anyone wants to get in front of me and start the trend. <laughs> so as we head into next week, the legacy offering, to be very transparent, we need a miracle. We need God to show up. We need God to move in the hearts of his people. We need people to be on board with what God is doing here. And if if the book dries up, then God has a, another brook somewhere else. I'm, I'm aware of that. This is God's church to build, not mine. But as a church, we need people to be committed financially. We need people to fund the vision. We need people to also show up and serve, be a part. We, we need children's ministry workers. Guys, we're never going to we're never going to grow this church any higher than we are right now if we don't have an active, engaging children's ministry to reach the families that are coming in our door. We need, we need greeters that smile. The smilers we got now are wonderful. Did you fire all the non-smilers already? Yeah. So we've only got smilers now that greet. But that's what we're looking for, more friendly people that greet. We need people that are ready to fund this thing and to fuel this thing and facilitate what God is doing at the Exchange Church. But here's what I don't want. I don't want you to go home and count your cash. I don't want you to sit across from your spouse and say, well, it, 
It's a faith offering, so it should hurt a little bit. What's the most that we can do? That's not the point. The point is to let your generosity flow from gratitude. So you sit down with your spouse and your family and and you talk about all the things you're grateful for, how the Lord has brought you to the Exchange Church and what the Exchange Church is doing in the community, how it's impacted your life, your family. Let that gratitude be the conversation of your home, not your budget. God may want you to give $3 million and you only make 30 grand a year. If God tells you to give $3 million, he's going to provide it. He provides seed to the sower. So it's not about fitting it in a budget. It's about cultivating generosity through gratitude. So you have the conversation at home about the gratitude that God is stirring in your heart. And then you ask the big question. Holy Spirit, what do you want us to give this Sunday? And if he says $5, go with it. If he says $5 million, go with it. It's not about the amount, guys. It is about us as a body collectively stirring gratitude because gratitude is the key that is going to get us through this thing. And when I say us, collectively, the community who's gone through massive trauma over the last three years. I get that the economy is suffering. Some of you are a little poorer because you invested in crypto, I think. I get it. It's unstable, it's scary, but you know what's not scary? When Holy Spirit tells you what to do. Because he sees around the bend, he sees around the corner, he knows he's not gonna build this ministry to hurt your family. It's gonna be a win for us all because we're in this together. So Father, I ask that you would be with us. God, we are a people who desperately want to walk in the joy that you've established for us. It's our birthright. So let gratitude be stirred. Let us make the choice to be grateful. Let us make the choice to lift up our eyes toward heaven, not look at what's in our hand, not look at the lack that's in our hand, but let gratitude stir within us so that our joy may be complete. God, also let our gratitude be stirred this week as we step out in faith and generosity as a a body of believers who, who want more for this city. You're not done with this city, God. God, we thank you that you are the author of the vision and you are the funder of the provision. If there's anyone among us today who senses a call to come home. A call to say yes to Jesus who died on the cross for your sin so that you could be in right relationship. And not just so that you could be right, so that you can be well. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus, whether in the room or watching online, just make a motion so I know who we're praying for. You're ready to say Yes, you're ready to give your life to Jesus today. Just wave at me. Thank you. Church, will you just repeat this prayer after me? Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. That he was buried and he rose again. I believe that I can be in right relationship with you. I repent for my sin. I ask that you wash me anew. From this day forward, my life will never be the same. I won't be perfect, but I'll be changed from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you just said yes to Jesus, text next to 512-980-1220. We love you guys so much. So glad that you're here. Thank you for coming to church. We'll see you next week, 10.30 a.m. for Legacy Sunday. Have a blessed week. Take what you received in here and give it out there. God bless you.